most of the time when you speak to people from companies and stuff, and yeah, um, sometimes the corporate bullshit can catch up. In a corporate structure, I think it's very hard, regardless of where you are in the world, to be equally respected as the other gender. I'm getting into a, an elevator, or I'm getting out of an elevator, and men just don't even acknowledge your existence. Welcome to another episode of Bar Talks. We are here in Dubai in the lovely bar called Koya. I am with Caitlin Hill, the brand ambassador for the Middle East, Africa, and India for Remy Contro, uh, a tour de force, a vagabond, a. For those of you who don't know you as well as I do, yeah. what is the life story? Like, you are now, uh, I would say, being a brand ambassador for Middle East, Africa, and India, it's such a broad job. <laughs> Yes. It's such a huge area to cover. The amount of just casually 50% of the world, but you know. well, that's what I'm saying. So most of the time, people are like, "Oh, cool! I'm on the BA for Belgium. There's only 20 people living here, and 15 of them uh, make nice. make beer." Um, I, be I would get bored right away. Yeah, and you are casually in charge of 3.5, 4 billion people. Mm -hmm. In theory, how did we get here? Like, where did it all start? Because you, where, who are you? Where are you from? It's your jam. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. America and moved to Cape Town, South Africa when I was 13. Uh, my parents decided to be a part of the change in South Africa. This is 1994. Apartheid had just ended uh, um, when they were on a private yacht or boat with me in the Caribbean and my brother. Uh, the crew was South African and yeah, they were just blown away by their stories that they would tell. Um, and at this stage, my parents had kind of left the corporate world already going, we're going to be a part of change in Atlanta. Did that for a couple of years. And then six years later, up and moved their whole family to Cape Town. I think. What a move. Yeah, it's a pretty wild thing to do. Yeah, because I get it. Like, oh, we'll move to Canada. We'll move to Mexico, we'll yeah. move to Hawaii. Yeah, we're going to go like miles out and down and south in a place that's in the in the papers for all the wrong reasons. So it was really hard in the beginning, like being a 13 year old white girl from America living in Cape Town, South Africa. Sounds really beautiful, right? But I was homeschooled, so to make friends was difficult. I wouldn't change anything though, because like for me, it was probably the best thing my parents ever did for my brother and I. Mm -hmm. Like You are who you are. I guess. Yeah, but I think to live abroad from a young age, especially as an American, is something that doesn't really happen I matriculated early, like I get bored pretty quickly. Uh, my mom was like, all right, if you're done with this, here's three months and here's the book to write your uh, GED, which is your general equivalency diploma. Mm. If you get it right on the first one, great. You don't have to do any more school. I was like, okay, let's go. How, how old were you then? 16. Well, Africa is a huge continent. Middle East is complicated as well. Uh, India, <laughs> all, all three very unique things. Yes. How did you get into booze? So I kind of took my time to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Mm. Uh, I, I'm really grateful that I have supportive parents that kind of and pushed me and encouraged me to try out anything that I was interested in. So I studied photography for a little while. Uh, I got accepted into fashion design school. While I was waiting to get into fashion design school, I was working as a chef at like a Michelin star restaurant. Casual. 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 Never went to culinary school, but was the chef de parte. Did like all the hot and cold sorters. Oh shit. Um, it taught me the basics of communication in our industry. Dropped out of fashion design school. Hated it. Right. Fuck. I was like, well, what happened was I was at a particular school and it closed before my final year. And fashion school is very much, everybody kind of has their own curriculum and different focuses. So they had made agreements with certain schools, you know, we'll take on your students, did a couple of interviews, went to one, really hated it. First term, they were like, oh, maybe you should go back to our second year course. And I was like, fine, whatever. At this stage, my parents had moved back to the States. So it's kind of like living free for the first time without parents. And then I was just like, actually, I don't like this. Called my dad like one day in the middle of a shopping center, like crying on the phone saying, I'm not happy. He's like, well, if you're not happy, then just leave. Mm. And he'd already paid for like the full year. And he was like, but your happiness is more important. Yeah, it's not about the money. So from there, uh, I started working as an au pair because obviously I needed to pay mm. bills and rent and whatever. 
um, joined a football team because when I first moved to South Africa, I had been playing football for, I think, four years at that stage. Loved it. Uh, but if you weren't a part of a school in South Africa, it was really difficult to find like a sports team. Right. So I didn't play for a few years. Finally found like a, a team and, you know, league that I could join. And one of the girls on the team in a WhatsApp chat group that we had was like, oh, I've got a friend who's opening up a bar. Is anybody interested like in a waitress position? And I was like, yeah, I could do with some more money. Let's try that out. Mm. And this, that's, was, oh, this was in Cape Town. Yeah, and that's the first bar I ever worked at, Orphanage Cocktail Emporium. I, want, I like talking to people who've done sport, especially team sport. Yeah. Because I think that liking a sport is not the same thing as participating in a sport. Yeah. Also participating in a sport on just like PE at school versus yeah. being part of a team yeah. and doing it in a much more professional yeah. sort of direction is also different. For you, how long did you do football? I think I just stopped like around 27, so like 10 years ago. What transferable things that sport taught you that you think really work in hospitality? Communication, um, being able to read people, uh, and showing up. Showing up? Yeah, like as in you're on time for your practice, you're on time for your shift. Right. In fact, yeah. you probably arrived early if you're doing it well. Mm. Um I think also kind of being flexible in the sense that not like, oh, I can stretch in the sense that more than what your job or your position is often going to be required from you. Right, 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 right. And if you're flexible on that sense, then A, you're going to learn more skills and B, you're also showing up for your team players. I, I know we always talk about bar teams. Yeah. Right. And like the internationally best bar team, right? Yeah. And... I have no idea how that award works because like you'll need to see the entire bar team in action to be able to award such I reckon event. the best bar team is never going to be recognized because they don't want to. Because they're too busy doing barring the bar? They're too busy being a team. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, how do you how do you pick that award? You know, how do you yeah. pick the best bar team? It, like, surely that's a difficult. Like, what if you have a super small tight team versus you have a mega venue like Goya? Oh, yeah. <laughs> where it's like uh, that's 40 of us yeah I'm like fuck how do you evaluate that you yeah know? um is, does does the quantity for me like you know you know this but uh i'm co-chair for africa and middle east uh with tales of the cocktail um for me it's a really important uh, uh thing to be a part of because i want to see better representation for that part of the world but uh when i'm looking at best international bar team, that type of thing. It's also about the leaders of those teams and mm -hmm. how they tap into upskilling their uh, members, uh, how they get them to work together. What do they do with them outside of work? Mm -hmm. You know, are you, are you really investing in the people that work with you and the family that you've created, not just because you want to make money? Yes, this business is about the bottom line, but it's about people first and foremost. And that's your client as well as your employees and yourself. So f football until 27. Yeah. Um, how long have you done BA style work? Seven years. And I, I ask this to brand ambassadors all the time. Like, how did you get the job? Like, so, like it's it, everyone has a super unique story. Like everyone wants to be a BA. Yeah. But then no one has, like, there's not like a website you can go on, hey, get a BA, you know, it's... It, well, everyone, everyone wants to be a BA until they know what it's like to be a BA. After working at Orphanage for about three to four years, can't remember exactly, um, I did, like, social media and kind of marketing and, you know, bookings and waitering for them. That's where I fell in love with cocktails, um, fell in love with the art of creating a cocktail, telling that story. I... Uh, Moved about two doors down and managed a gin bar called Mother's Ruin. Closed down now. Yeah. yeah. That was wild because I made a severe amount of mistakes that I'm very grateful for because I learned so much. Um, through that, I was introduced to the botanist gin. Um, and I got to go foraging and make cocktails. And I was like, wow. Because also, you know, with a little bit of a background in the culinary industry, flavor is obviously... Being you know, a chef. Yeah. Something that is important in both the cocktail world and the food world. And 
I'd never been foraging before. Like, I'd never heard of this fancy little term of picking plants that grow wildly. Well, it's also like once you, if you're a city person, it's like, that's dangerous. Yeah. Like, you're going to die. Exactly. Uh, so, like, really got into that, started making a lot of cocktails, and then was part of a competition. Didn't win the competition. Landed up getting to go to the distillery, though. Because <laughs> the guy who had won, uh, he couldn't go. Uh, and I was the runner-up. And I always say this, it's really important to Ching. remember that being a runner-up is just as important. Mm. You don't know if it's, whatever's going to happen. So one day I was like at the gym, getting a text from the then brand ambassador, and he's like, hey, can you like go to Scotland next week? And I was like, uh, why? I didn't, uh, casual. <laughs> yeah, I didn't win the competition. Why do you want me to go to Scotland? And he's like, yeah, well, somebody's come up for this person, so you're the runner-up, and we're sending you instead. And I was like, what? Went to the Brook Lady Distillery, yep. fell in love with Isla, magical place. And I realized, I, I went to visit a friend for like 10 days after that for a holiday, came back and the then brand manager for our distributor in South Africa was like, hey, can I swing by the bar and have like a quick meeting with you? And I was like, why did I fuck yeah. up? Like what, immediately what, what I was I like, done? what have I done? And he comes across and he's like asking me all these like weird questions. And I landed up going on this uh, experience that Remy Quantro used to do called the fourth dimension. Done it. Fourth dimension, buddies. I landed up going to Paris for the experience. Yep. While I was there, I was like, yep, don't want to be working in the same bar every day. Um, came back, quit my job. And uh, I asked the brand manager for our products in South Africa at the time if I could get a meeting because I knew the brand ambassador was leaving. Uh, he organized for me to have a cup of coffee. He was like, what? I, you would consider this job? And I was like, yeah, uh, duh. And had a cup of coffee with um, my previous zone director, uh, Antoinette Drum, uh, lovely, lovely woman who's my mentor. Mm. Um, <laughs> she famously likes to tell a story, you know, typical interview question, where do you see yourself in 10 years time? And I was like, toing and froing in my mind, how do I, I don't want to answer this. Do I want to answer this honestly and transparently? Or do I want to like fluff it? Mm. And I just went, in your seat. And she was just like, okay, cool. You're in. You're in. You have a plan. So she took a chance on me. But was that a fluffed answer? No, that was the honest answer. That was the honest answer. I mean, I knew I wouldn't get there in 10 years time, but that's kind of the goal is eventually you can sit back and create opportunities for other people. And um, I mean, I do that amazingly already like but to to do it from a corporate sort of structure would be incredible and yet here we are speaking to the ambassador for Remy Contro not a small company not a whatever brand yeah for um for India and Middle East and Africa yeah how do you compare the industry for the way you see it here and how you were growing up yeah versus say maybe some of the outside of the uh this region's bars look i think there are certainly issues um but i i would also like to break the kind of understanding or myth that you know women aren't you know uh safe in this region of the world or any of that like in in a corporate structure I think it's very hard, regardless of where you are in the world, to be equally respected as the other gender. That being said, though, you could be a trailblazing, like, go get them type of person or woman in the Middle East very easily. Like, there are many women that I know in this region that are extremely successful within this industry, uh, to name a few, like a Rebecca Sturtz. You know, my other colleague, Carolina Tarkovskita, she's the private client director for Louis Trez of the Middle East. But that being said, like as much as UAE and Dubai in particular is the safest city in the world for women to live in, uh, of course there are still, you know, things that happen in dark corners as it is in every part of the world. So uh, we're gonna have a little beverage here. This is uh, yum, 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 yum. Mountain Gay Eclipse. It safe, is. Responsible drinking. I like it. Not too much. I think I, I Salvatore Calabrese at a perfect 25 ml. Uh, <laughs> obviously, obviously. Yeah. Uh, with some three cents pineapple soda. I'm very excited. Uh, the whole pineapple soda with uh, rum is going to be fucking delicious. Yeah, I can dig that. Squeeze a lime. I just went back to Barbados, bro. <laughs> the the fourth dimension was, I think, the most ROI negative thing yeah. I've ever been to in my life. 
For those of you who don't know, the fourth dimension was an activation by Remy Contro where you were invited to go to Paris and you did. And you had no idea what you were doing. You had no idea what you were doing. Somebody recommended you. You were recommended by a bartending friend. Yeah, somebody who had been on the one before you. Yeah. Who's already done the, yeah, the, the, the one. Experience. And then the without getting too deep into what we were doing, because there was a lot of different things. A lot of different But things. none of them were related to booze. Nope. At all. With nope. from from ballet to fashion to sports. Uh, sports was cool. The explorer stuff that we did, the jewelry. The design. Yeah. The jewelry. jewelry. And so now that I've put two and two together, look at the Isla Retreat. If you don't, if you don't mind telling us a little bit more about what we just did, um, there's a lot of links and similarities yeah. between A and B. Sure. So what is the Isla Retreat? Why was I here? <laughs> Why am I here? So this is something I was gonna segue in, in the sense that we we're talking about guest shifts a moment ago. As Remy Quantro, African Middle East and India, we don't do guest shifts unless they have a purpose. Right. The just purpose. The, pur the purpose isn't. Visibility, purpose isn't, uh, you know, volume, none of that. It's, there's a story that gets told. And my amazing, crazy marketing manager, Rebecca Stewart, had an idea about nine years ago for something like this that we just did with the Isla Retreats. When she and I started working together about three years ago, it was the first kind of creative project that we were like, all right, I want to do this. I want to do this. She had a spider chart and all sorts of different things. And like, spider chart. Oh, yeah. Um, and having gone on fourth dimension, I was able to contribute a lot towards it because the Isla Retreat had nothing to do with booze either. Yes, there were booze there, but it's idea in terms of like a marketing branding perspective is that the Brooklady Distillery is a B Corp company, which means that they value people, planet and profit equally. And, uh, Every three years, they get tested to see if you know okay. there's still diversity. There's still B Corp does that, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, um, you know equality. There's still uh, upskilling. There's still old people working in your company. There's still young people working in your company. Like a whole bunch of different things. Also, like how sustainably you operate your business. Um, so for us, we made the connection in the sense that if we are a B Corp company and we value people, planet, and profit equally, then we need to give back towards the persons that build our brands in the, our markets. So uh, not all of the distilleries currently in Remy Guantra are B Corp. It takes a long time to get your certification for it, etc. People, terroir, and time is uh, what our values are as a company, which started with Brickladdy. No way. Yeah. So. When the Brooklady Distillery reopened, they uh, went around and rehired everybody who had worked at the distillery when it was mothballed, but was interested to work with them again. And this is uh, because they valued the community they were a part of. And also there's a practical side to it. The Brooklady Distillery uses all the original equipment from 1881. You need people to operate that. Not a lot of people have those skills. It's not something that gets transmitted from a tiny little island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. 5,000 people live in it. 3,000. Fantastic. 10,000 sheep. So people uh, is a big part of the Brooklady Distillery and of course Remy Fuentro. Terroir being that Isla has a really unique terroir. Um, yeah, you can grow barley anywhere in the world, but uh, if you grow it on Isla, it's going to taste damn different than the mainlands of Scotland or Absolutely. England or whatever. And then time, you have to mature your spirit. Patience is is, is a virtue. Absolutely. Uh, I'm completely uh, out of the blue, but also to, to discuss it. You keep mentioning Rebecca, right? Yeah. So um, she actually ties in a lot into the story in many ways. Rebecca Sturt is arguably the founder of Dubai's bartending community. Yes. And this is before her time in Remy Contra. Yep. She was not part of Remy Contra yep. before. I think she's been here almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. Yeah. And if there's any testament or a proof of concept yeah. that women in the Middle East can do stuff, also on top of that, everything we've talked about this, that women in the Middle East can get shit done, that you can have a bartending community in the Middle East, yep. even though technically it's Muslim countries and blah, 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 uh, that patience is what you need to build anything yeah that um 
that the, 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 the culture is the most important thing. She's done all of that. I've yeah. been coming here for eight years and she's always present one way or another and it's always about the community. And that is the only thing, the only reason the community here is so strong. And I would argue that it's probably a top three, top two community in the world. There's yeah. not a community like this. 80 people came to this retreat that we yeah. talked about. 80. Imagine 50 bartenders in the mountains. But also they were ready to go at 10 a.m. after a, a weekend, yeah, after so, a Saturday. Yeah, you had to come uh, to the meeting point. Again, they had no idea what they were doing. They just trusted that the people who had invited them and the brands that were involved in it went, cool, we're doing a two-day immersive experience. You've been invited, da 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 Here's your packing list. Show up at this place at this time, 10 a.m. on a Sunday. They were all there. After a lot of them uh, you know, probably went to bed at like 6 a.m. You know, there was one that texted me going at 9.57, I just woke up. Still made it. Still made it. Still made it. There was one that uh, hadn't read everything properly and thought that like we were just going to go out for the day and then they were going to come back at night and then would get up and go out again the following day. Okay, so he, he arrived with no luggage. What did he do? He went home, packed a bag, drove himself. Commitment. That's, that's, that's cool. That's cool. It was part of the whole thing. Yeah. So the Isla Retreat as a proof of concept or concept or whatever is all about like health and wellness and mindfulness so there were things like meditation yoga hiking uh rock painting when you're doing a thing when you're present in the moment yeah you don't realize how cool the moment is sometimes right and it's only in hindsight do you realize fuck i was a part of that yeah so, really cool moment and those moments sometimes they come and go you can never predict them you can possibly put the cogs in place yeah but you know they don't always work out so sometimes that's me they were sleepless nights going is this gonna work and there's sometimes you sit and you speak to people that were possibly in other parts of the world such as like london or new york or singapore and you're like oh man that was cool and you're like fuck i want out that sounds really cool but I, you have no emotional connection because yeah. you weren't there. Yeah. And I and I think what's really beautiful now is that I think this could be one of those things that happened that is definitive for a community. So I feel like right now Dubai is going through possibly like a real amazing golden age. I agree. And it's I, I feel very privileged to be present in that moment. Me too. Um, because now I'm older, having I'm I'm I have the intuition. He's older, he's wiser. Well, I, you, I have the intuition to go like, oh shit, this is like a really good moment, and I'm here, and I'm like, and then like, I almost your fingers on the pulse. Yeah, and I'm like, cool, I'm I'm recognizing it. Um, so sound frequencies. <laughs> People are gonna be watching this, going like, what is going on right now? What is how? So I mean, in the same way that you only really received like the agenda of our activities. Like what the day before? Yeah, yeah. Because we also wanted to keep as much secret from you guys as we could, and we also didn't tell you what to talk about. That there, was tough. There was some, there was some, some guidelines, perhaps, but I think, you know, it was really amazing because you had to improv. You could talk about, uh, you know, things that you thought were relevant. Uh, we had Corey. Corey Hall from I'm talking about nutrition and doing cacao ceremonies and yeah. all sorts of things, but like no preconceived notions, whether it was a part of the organization or the attendance. Yeah. And that for me was the hardest like part of organizing it is, you know, for two weeks prior to everybody's like, are, are you going to the Isla retreat? Do you know anything about this? Mm. I'm getting like text messages, phone calls. And then, you know, you send out like my survival list, I'm getting girls calling me going, are we going to be camping? Like, am I going to be cold? Do I need this? And you're just like, I can't tell you anything other than you're going to have a great time. Show up. Come prepared. And I can't tell you how many persons messaged me afterwards going, thank you so much for pushing me to go. Thank you so much for organizing this, etc." Like, to be a part of, like, that, it's a, a career highlight for me. 